Hello everyone, I'm Ryan from Fireside Knicks with my friend and co-host Dylan Backer. And in today's episode, we're trying to take a little bit of a guess here at what we think the Knicks' first move of the offseason is going to be. Now, obviously the draft doesn't count for this because... Well, yeah, that's the obvious first thing that would happen, whether it's trading a pick or selecting a player. Um, But we're talking in terms of when the free agency period opens, when teams typically start making uh, player trades. Now, technically speaking, yes, the Knicks uh, could make a draft day trade with players involved, and that would count. Um, And so I guess that would be something that would be interesting to kind of uh, delve into. But, you know, um, there are definitely some obvious things that would come out as the, like, you know, first or the expected moves most notably being the re- the return of Josh Hart you kind of expect that to be one of the first things they do uh when free agency opens up but with that being said there's a lot to talk about in terms of you know the Knicks offseason plans and all that stuff so I figured we'd just get things started Dylan how are you doing today my friend and let me know a little bit about what you think the Knicks first move could be in the offseason right so one of the first moves I believe you know I feel like Obi Toppin might be one of the first moves. I really do. You know, we mentioned him in our last one of our recent videos about the possibility of him getting traded or what the Knicks might do about him. I think they're going to have to figure out something about him immediately because, you know, it was kind of awkward that he stayed on the team past the deadline. You know, I think a lot of people were pretty shocked about it, and I'm pretty sure Obi was kind of shocked that he was still on the team as well past the trade deadline. So I feel like, you know, he'll be one of the first moves for sure. Like, I feel like a trade of some sort is is in order i really do i feel like that's the most likely outcome you know like you said a trade to a team that's like unproven like a young team like say like indiana or even oklahoma city a team like that i feel like you know something i want to highlight too the knicks i remember if I, if I remember correctly they got isaiah roby i believe it was it was i believe it was him and they got him last season kind of just you know out of nowhere it seemed like for no reason i wonder if they got him in sp- with the idea of like thinking that like Obi might get moved, you know, preparing for a possible Obi trade, you know, it was either him or Darius Baisley, I believe it was Isaiah Roby, I don't fully remember the name, but it was an Oklahoma City forward, I do remember that, and it was a power forward, and you know that that intrigued me. I wonder if that means that they know that Obi is going to be on the move and they have something, you know, coming up soon for him. That's something to be watching out for. You know, another thing that I think is important that might happen this offseason right away, Josh Hart, you know, his contract. You know, I think the extension is going to come up pretty soon. I'm pretty sure, you know, they're just waiting to be able to officially sign the paperwork and officially enter the free agency period so that he can just sign it off and become a New York Knick officially for the, you know, the next few years. I think those are some of the first moves that will happen this offseason. I feel like, you know, a splash trade or a blockbuster trade is going to wait a little bit until it gets deeper into the offseason or at peak trade period, which is usually like at late June or early July type type time, right before summer league, but right after the draft. I feel like that's when you'll see like the big splash blockbuster move. I don't think you're going to see it day one of the offseason. What do you think about all that? Yeah, you know, interestingly enough, I think Obi Toppin kind of stands out as one of those front runners for the first move. You know, personally speaking, I think it ends up being Josh Hart uh, getting re-signed. But, you know, the draft is an interesting situation because we saw the Knicks move a plethora of players last draft uh, when they moved their first-round pick, um, including New Orleans Noel, Alec Burks, and I forgot forget the last player involved in that trade i believe it was uh no reggie pollock was not involved in that trade he wasn't even on the team uh but i know that that was the trade in which uh you know they, they moved jalen durand essentially to detroit they opened up a lot of capital uh in terms of finances and they were able to sign jalen brunson because of it also got some uh future draft compensation so overall that trade worked out really well for the knicks because again they were able to land jalen brunson that was the big fish for them uh in the off season but i wonder if toppin is involved in a deal like that not that toppin is making an absurd amount of money where the knicks have to move if they want to do anything over the offseason. Um, but could they say, hey, you know, um, we'll trade Obi for, you know, what a second round pick this year. Um, and we'll try to, you know, see what we can do with those picks. Or maybe those they package said picks and, and try to, you know, just throw them into future assets. We know how Leon Rose likes to stockpile picks in the future. It feels like it feels like there's nothing available in the draft that'll uh, serve the Knicks any value to, uh, today. They'll they'll trade for the future, and you know maybe they do that with Obi Toppin, and, and that could end up being the first move because they could they can do that a lot earlier than they can re-sign Josh Hart, but. I still think it ends up being Josh Hart. I feel like the Knicks are going to have a pretty quiet draft, all things considered. They don't have a first-round pick. Um, unfortunately, the Mavs somehow didn't make the postseason despite acquiring the services of Kyrie Irving. I just want to reiterate that they acquired Kyrie Irving, an all-star, uh, a future Hall of Famer, and they did not make the postseason. Um, Luka Doncic, if you want to slide over with your boy Jalen Brunson, you can always do that. Um, but uh, all things considered, I think the Knicks will have a pretty quiet draft. So my prediction is I- I'm going to stay strong and firm on the Josh Hart take. I think it's going to be Josh Hart. I think 
think he's going to be the first. I think it's going to be like the Jalen Brunson thing where second free agency opens up, you're going to see the <laughs> breaking. The Knicks and Josh Hart have reached an agreement on, you know, a four-year deal or a three-year deal. I, I'm still unsure as to how long the length of that deal will be. Um, but, you know, for like a dark horse pick, you know, if you had to pick a dark horse guy, another draft day trade you could maybe see is maybe an Evan Fournier guy, right? You know, where obviously, you know, you, f- you he's obviously not going to be in the rotation. Even if he's here next year, he's not going to play much for the New York Knicks, if at all, unless there's injuries and the Knicks just need someone to come off the bench, kind of like how he did last year, where he had that iconic, more of a one-night stand quote. That was hilarious. I love, I, I love that quote. Um, but... You know, maybe another situation where the Knicks are looking to move off of Fournier to open up some, uh, you know, money for free agency. Again, you know, the Knicks aren't necessarily strapped for cash, but it's nice to have the flexibility. Um, You mentioned Toppin potentially going to a more unproven team. If you're the Knicks and and you're looking at the landscape of this league, right, the the league is always valued shooting. And if Fournier uh, is on a bad team and has an opportunity to take shots and get some minutes and, uh, you know, get some spacing and show off his three-point shooting abilities, I don't know how you feel about this, but I I think a team would want to trade for that. And I think if you're a team like Detroit um, or, you know, just a team that's probably not going to make the postseason or has a lot of uh, shots up for grabs, um, you really don't have much to lose. You you, you acquire a second-round pick or something along that along those lens uh, for a guy like Evan Fournier, and then you flip him again at the deadline. You know, Jay Crowder got, what, four round, four second round picks, right? I think that, that was that trade, and he didn't play in the postseason that final game, or he was out of the playoff rotation. Um, so, you know, I, I, I personally think Fournier is actually a pretty good flyer to take for a lot of teams as an NBA veteran, a guy who's had good years before. It really, it was one rough, rough year with the Knicks that really uh, did him in in terms of his tenure here going forward. So what do you think about that? And, and you know, do you think he has enough value to get traded that, or at least be a commodity for a team, even if they still have to give up a pick to get rid of him. I definitely think Fournier has like some value to him because yeah, we all know he's a god awful defender. You know, you can't put him on the floor if you need defense, but he is a good scorer. You know, he does shoot the three ball pretty well for what it's worth. You know, people forget too that Fournier did have the most three pointers out of any Knicks player ever in his first season as a Nick. Of course, defensively it was disastrous, and that's a big reason why we were not able to compete for a playoff spot. But it's not like Fournier was like. The 100% issue, you know, they had a horrible point guard situation as well. No, no really, like, not really much help alongside. I'm not saying, like, Fournier needed to be having help. No, I'm just saying, like, you know, it's not 100% on him. Therefore, I do think he has value. I don't think he has, like, absolutely no value at all. He just doesn't have a place for this Knicks team, you know. This is just not exactly the place for him, especially with, you know, the development of guys like Quentin Grimes, Emmanuel Quickly. There's just no reason to be playing Fournier. It just wouldn't make sense, right? That's why he's not in the rotation. That's why he doesn't play, you know, of course, the defensive issues, you know, that's a liability. You wanted to stiffen up the defense a bit, and that's why they play the younger guys who are, you know, a little more athletic, have fresher legs, a little more burst to them. But other than that, you know... Fournier has value, I think. And like you said, I think he could go to a team that's, you know, not not saying he could go to like a contender, but like, you know, he could go, a team would be willing to take a flyer on him, see if he can help improve their shooting, especially if the team needs shooting. You know, if there's like teams out there that really struggle from three point range, you know, they really struggle to score from outside, they might take a flyer on Fournier. They might, you know, you might not get much out of him if you're the Knicks, but. You might be able to get like maybe a second round pick or draft compensation or something along those lines. I don't think you're going to really get like a player for him. I don't think I don't really know if you could throw him in a big package at this point. Maybe if this was last off season, you would have had that chance. But you kind of I think they, they kind of missed that chance now because they didn't really play him this year. So I feel like now at this point, you're just going to get like draft compensation and no players in return for Fournier. But that's not a bad thing. You know, the Knicks love to stockpile their draft picks and they love to use it as you know, they haven't used it really yet, but it's clear they're trying to use those picks as like a trade trade bait and to hopefully get like a big splash move we haven't seen that splash move yet we're hoping it comes you know this offseason but you know you don't just stockpile picks for the heck of it you know you stockpile picks for a reason you want to use those in like trades and stuff and especially if you're a competing team like the Knicks are you're not going to be using all those draft picks in the draft you're going to be using those as tr- in trades that's just simple as that you know and I think they can do that they can get something like that out of Fournier because like I said, he is he for what it is, he is valuable. He does have good shooting. He's one of the better you know, he is one of the better shooters out there. You know, he's definitely one of the better shooters that's available. You know, if you if you're willing to take a step back on defense, then that's on them for the, for doing that. Because we all know Fournier is not exactly a good defender at all whatsoever. But with his shooting abilities, I mean teams might take a flyer if that means it improves their offense in some capacity. What do you think about all that? 
Yeah, no, definitely. And if you're a team, like, let's say, you know, and I'm not throwing out that these teams are the best fit for Fournier, because again, like, I don't necessarily know. I'm not in tune with their roster construction, as well as their fans are, and obviously the draft will affect this as well. But if you're Houston Rockets, or San Antonio Spurs, or, or Orlando Magic, or Charlotte Hornets, you know, now, the Spurs, depending on how Webb and Yama plays, you know, maybe that can change things. And the Rockets are looking to get Harden, so that, that can also change uh, the, the way that this is viewed as. But as currently constructed, they're likely to not make the postseason. Um, and even if they were, if you were to require a guy like Fournier and then flip at the deadline, like, look, there's always going to be teams that need shooting, right? We looked la la like last year, right? The Lakers, you know, I think the, the fact that they were able to turn their season around by acquiring a lot of shooting and depth is going to have an impact on a lot of other teams to say, all right, at the deadline, let's emphasize depth. I think the Suns not making it uh, past the Nuggets in the playoffs, despite the fact that they had KD and Devin Booker. And, and quite frankly, they look overmatched in that series. It felt like Denver was in control right after they won game two. Um, you know, teams are looking to like, to, to strengthen their depth and the, the way that the new luxury cap, uh, luxury tax and the, the cap situation works with the new CBA, you're going to be punished even harder for going over that luxury tax. Um, so for teams, you know, getting that third co-star and forming those super teams that we used to see in the early 2010s and mid 2010s, obviously the most infamous ones being the Golden State Warriors and that Miami Heatles team, um, right? Like you're not going to really see those as much anymore unless players actively go out to take pay cuts and that hurts the player union. So I don't think that's going to be happening. So, you know, I, I think interestingly enough, like Fournier becomes a player where you're like, okay, if we acquire him and he's terrible, well, we just got him for a second round pick and we still have to pay him. But, you know, money is money. You know, you're with TV revenue and all this stuff, the popularity of the NBA, these teams are going to make their money back. Um, and the upside is, hey, he shoots well. He doesn't even have to be like a plus in terms of like actual court impact. If he's just a plus offensively, a team that's more defensively oriented may say, all right, 40 years is a great option. Look at the Cleveland Cavaliers. I think of the Cleveland Cavaliers at the deadline were very similar teams to the team they were last year. And Evan Fournier was shooting pretty well or, or playing to his, the back of his uh, basketball card, they would be a type of team to try to trade for him and say, hey, we need scoring off the bench. We need someone who can just kind of jolt this offense off the bench. They're a very good defensive team. Quite frankly, I'd argue they're one of the best defensive teams in the NBA. Um, that would be a team that you're like, okay, we could use a guy like Fournier if he can prove himself at the deadline, right? You know, there's always going to be a need for shooting, so I think it'll have value going forward. And I guess kind of like the last dark horse kind of like throw it throw this uh out there and kind of see what the reaction is and i want to get your take on this is do you think the first move is bringing in someone from outside of the organization so do you think their first move is like do you think there's a free agent out there um that maybe they shock everyone by signing hardenstein wasn't the guy that the knicks were like they were i mean everyone was talking about hardenstein's gonna go to the knicks like that was just kind of out of nowhere i felt like i wanted hardenstein when when he was a free agent free agent because the knicks needed a backup uh center and i thought he could help space the floor he contributed in different ways but he ended up signing with the Knicks, it ended up being a, I mean, I, I think it ended up being a really impactful move. Jalen Brunson was rumored for the Knicks. I mean, everyone knew it was going to sign with the Knicks, so that's a different situation, but do you think there's a chance that it's an external guy? And if you were to guess, who do you think that external guy could be? Right, so, you know, honestly, I don't think their first move is bringing in someone from outside the organization. I think their first moves are going to be in-house moves, whether it's, you know, like I said, getting moving top in a way or signing Josh Hart. They're going to be moves of players that are already in-house is my point that I'm trying to make. I think that's definitely going to be their first move. But if they were to make a move outside the organization as their first move, I don't think it's going to be like a blockbuster trade. I feel like it would be like, you know, a small trade for, you know, maybe like a backup forward or something that nobody really expected any the Knicks to get, but they went ahead and got anyway and will kind of just leave fans like, "Okay, whatever, you know, let's see how let's see what he's got, I guess, you know, maybe he'll play, you know, a lot in preseason and he'll shine out and get a good spot in the regular season rotation or something like that, but you know, necessarily, I don't think it'll be like a Carl Anthony Towns trade or a Joel Embiid trade. I don't think that's going to happen first. I don't. You know, I wish it would. I wish, you know, of course, we don't. I don't want Cat, but, you know, I'm just speaking in terms of all-star, superstar type move. I wish that would be like the first move, but I honestly don't think it will be. I feel like their first moves are going to be within the organization, and I, I firmly will believe that too. Because the Knicks are usually the type to kind of, you know, hold out and see what other teams offer before they just go ahead and shell out a bunch of picks and stuff or other players to go get a player. They usually like to wait. You know, we kind of saw that with Donovan Mitchell. They kind of waited and waited and see like, okay, you know, what's the deal with that? And, you know, they had RJ on their hands too. They were trying to figure out what to do with that. So they were kind of like, okay, let's see what we got here. Let's see. Let's wait. Let's wait. Ended up taking keeping RJ because Danny Ainger set up that fake deadline or whatever that, that the Knicks couldn't go get Mitchell after that. So, after that, it was pretty much they just kept RJ and you knew they were out of that race. But, you know, Mitchell didn't even get end up getting traded until, like, uh, close to September. 
end of August, you know, splash moves like that sometimes take a while. Sometimes they take a good amount of the offseason because so many teams are gauging out their options and figuring out, like, you know, what what options do they want to get rid of. And the team that is trading that player is trying to figure out who's giving them the best offer, who's the one that's like, okay, we want to press this press the button here because I like this trade more than this trade and all that stuff. So, therefore... I think their first move is an in-house move, and if they do make a trade as their first move, I don't think it's going to be anything, you know, worth really noting. It'll just be like a small move that, you know, they might play, they might not even play at all, but, you know, I don't think it's going to be like something that's like a game-changing move, if that makes sense. What do you think about that? Yeah, no, I, I think it's the least likely option of the ones we discussed for them to go out and make an acquisition that is someone that isn't in the organization already or wasn't on the team last year. I think also on top of this, like if you're the Knicks, you probably want to have Josh Hart and figure out the finances with Josh Hart before you go and acquire someone else to potentially uh, muddy those waters because Josh Hart's integral to this team. And unless you're signing, I mean, there's really no one on the free agent market that you, set, you sign them and you're now the best team in the East or anything like that. So um, there's really no one that, like, look, I, no disrespect to James Harden, but, you know, it, 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 his track record in the postseason, it's it's now a thing, right? Like Joel I want to add too, like with with Harden, I'm not paying him two hundred million dollars. Right, I, I would I would not pay him two hundred million because he wants two hundred million. That's exactly. not happening for and, for me at least. That's a no go. And you know, I, I know that they're like, look, you know, Joel Embiid obviously didn't help in terms of you know the 76ers losing in seven games to the Celtics, but I I I genuinely believe that Joel Embiid is someone that would change your franchise. I don't feel the same way about Harden at this stage of his career. You know, if you said you know MVP James Harden, I'd be like, okay, at that point in time, we did we we saw a track record, but we weren't sure. Like, okay, is it just he's facing the Warriors a ton, or is he genuinely just a choker? I think we've reached that threshold of yeah, this dude's just a playoff choker. I hope for his sake he gets a ring. I have no ill will towards the guy um but that's just it is what it is um and i think josh hart's kind of going to be their priority in free agency um but i guess i i think if it's if it ends up if it's not josh hart i think it's a draft day deal and i think it's just something to either a move their second round pick to get future second round picks or just a future second round pick or moving top and off the roster moving fournier off the roster i think they're going to want to clear guys out before they start bringing in new blood into the organization. Because also, let's say you sign a power forward, right, to be your backup power forward, and Obi Toppin, you don't find a suitor for him. Now teams know you're trying to trade Toppin. They're not going to be like, oh, yeah, no, we'll 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 trade you two or three second rounds. They're like, no, you need to trade Toppin um, because you're going to have to. Um, and, and teams are not going to really look at him as someone to, uh, you know, try to, you know, bargain or not try, try to uh, negotiate with the Knicks. Um, they're just going to say, hey, you have to trade him, so you should just give him to us. Um, but with that being said, I, I think your point about Leon Rose being patient is excellent. I want to hear what people have to say in the comment section below. I know you guys are a very passionate fan base. You know, the Knicks are coming up with a pretty – this is a really important offseason, all things considered. So, you know, there's going to be a lot to talk about. Whether they make a lot of moves or not, you know, doesn't necessarily mean it's a good or bad offseason. The 2021 offseason improves. You can make a lot of moves and really have a bad offseason still. Um, and this all, last offseason showed you can make one or two moves and they can end up turning your team from bad to um, a finals contender at, at some point over the winter. So with that being said, we'd love to hear what you guys have to say in the comment section below. You can tweet at us on Twitter. You can check out our Instagram, TikTok, and our Facebook, and of course, this YouTube page. If you guys want to keep up with our podcast, make sure to turn on post notifications. You can check out Apple Podcasts or Spotify for the audio version of this podcast. And of course, you guys can check out our Twitter accounts. They're above our heads. And we'll see you guys in the next video. Thank you guys again for tuning in and peace out.